she, Francine Shapiro was said to have always regretted naming it eye movement desensitization and reprocessing this big long word, uh, EMDR. And that she, the statement was that she really preferred to call it reprocessing therapy because that's what we're doing. We're asking clients to reprocess old experiences um, and relieve symptoms. And so when you add in the eye movement thing, you get all kinds of expectations that it's going to put you into a trance or uh, change your um, yourself. But it, it's really about helping a client reprocess an experience so that they can remember it without re-experiencing the trauma in the moment, which is what uh, PTSD uh, includes. Okay, so that it's not hypnotherapy, that's one thing that you wanna make sure we're just separating, not that there's anything wrong with hypnotherapy or RTT or any of that piece or subconscious programming. A hundred percent. I absolutely <laughs> agree. I want to make sure that I'm that point. But I have had people come in maybe with a, a religious expectation that this wasn't totally. going to be healthy for them. And I, right. it, it's not at all. Anything else? There are a couple of um, contraindicated situations for, for EMDR. Oh. It's not great for active addictions. It's less effective mm. when somebody's using um, we know that for traumatic brain injury, it's also uh, a little bit more challenging. Uh, clients with a long, complex history of childhood uh, sexual abuse um, can really struggle with EMDR specifically, I've been told. Uh, mm -hmm. I just would recommend finding a therapist who is specifically trained in that particular issue. Mm -hmm. um, it's really, any trauma treatment is about resourcing and safety before you start any discussion of, of what happened to the client. And we uh, have been using this phrase, um, trauma informed a lot mm -hmm. in our field lately. We have it in yoga too. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And it's mm -hmm. really crucial that the therapist understand what yeah. that means. Yeah. Go slow, check in a lot. I really see my work and I feel like most of the colleagues that I have done my training with uh, would agree as, as walking side by side with a client, not pushing them in any way to do um, work that they're not ready to do. And that's pretty important. You know, when you come into EMDR, you're expecting transformation. And I think it is possible. It really is possible, but it, a big piece of it is taking it slow at the beginning because when um, a client is struggling with complex PTSD specifically, there are um, many different things that can uh, cause distress in the moment and later. And we want to make sure that a client has the resources, the safety uh, when they leave to, to uh, manage any symptoms that come up in between sessions. And um, that's, that takes a little bit of time. But what I love about the resourcing work that we have, um, resource tapping or installation, it's, it's more about activating what a client already has in yeah. them. We yeah. tap into our intuition. We can tap in to inner wisdom figures, we can tap into protectors. Uh, there's a, a wonderful uh, therapist, Laura Laurel Parnell, who's written quite a bit on that concept. And uh, the protocols that she's written are beautiful, and they work so well with my trauma survivor clients on mm -hmm. um, accessing the the parts of themselves that are already active and and just need a little bit of uh, permission to come forward and take take part. I did a training at Kripalu this spring with um, Richard Schwartz on um, internal family systems. Oh yeah. And, yeah. It came up that uh, a lot that, that currently the, the new, he told us this, I haven't uh, had it confirmed, but that the new training for EMDR incorporates IFS, which makes oh. total sense to me starting yeah. to, to look at the parts of yourself that are involved in this and protecting you from your trauma and, yeah. and how we can invite them to take a break or take on a new role. And if you can use those concepts with the tapping to stimulate mm -hmm. the, um, the neural network and create a new, a, a new understanding of yourself, it can be really powerful. Oh, ridiculous. Yes. Y E S. Absolutely. In <laughs> fact, the last podcast episode that, that just came out last week was with my friend, Jen, who's a yoga teacher who has been studying IFS and was like, Pleasance, you've got to hear about this. Can I come on the podcast and talk about it? And I was like, sure, let's talk about it. Cause I don't know anything about it. And I cannot be learning anything new right now. I am on a learning diet. I am in Ayurveda school and that's where I'm staying. So I get to like 
dabble and have fun with you guys and then stay in my lane and be like, yes. no, no. Um, so I love all the, those natural connections that are happening with the ah. systems again, to support people. Do you, in between sessions, do clients do some of the work on their own? Like, would it ever be healthy to do it and practice on your own? I'm just curious. Mm -hmm. So I know that there are actual guides out there for at home EMDR. And, yeah. You know, most of the comments from the therapy community is have a, have a therapist, a licensed yeah. therapist with you. Yeah. I agree. Uh, yeah. Because I, I do know that um, it can be really challenging to navigate that stuff by yourself. Yeah. But we do have some tools that clients use. We install uh, all kinds of self-soothing uh, techniques with EMDR before we start the reprocessing. So a guided imagery about um, creating a safe place, yeah. uh, light stream tools, just different things to help calm you down in the moment. Mm -hmm. But one of the tools that is my favorite that to teach people before we even start with EMDR is um, the butterfly hug. So you cross your arms in front of yourself mm -hmm. and hold onto your, uh, your elbows and you tap from side to side mm -hmm. slowly. And we're teaching this to children in war zones and mm -hmm. um, victims of earthquakes to navigate the anxiety that comes from those kinds of experiences. And the butterfly hug is just a, a very, soothing mm -hmm. thing to do for yourself um, in that moment. For if it really is useful for single incident trauma, but also mm -hmm. longer term um, traumatic abuse. You can use these kinds of um, self-soothing techniques to, to make it through your day. Um, mm -hmm. I think that all of the tools that we have in psychotherapy in general can be self-administered in many ways. If, if you are taking it from the view of it being a self-care routine, yeah. Uh, regular exercise, focusing right. on healthy food, focusing on healthy people in your world, journaling, crucial, mm -hmm. uh, just making sure that we have um, the tools to move our emotions through our bodies because emotions, mm -hmm. what do they say? They're like weather. They come and go mm -hmm. if, we, if we let them, but if we don't, they stay in our bodies and metabolize into difficult things. Mm -hmm. They block your chakras. Exactly. <laughs> same, same thing. We're talking about the exact same <laughs> I thing. Know. <laughs> um, okay. Before we close, just because I love talking all things brain and therapy, uh, what's the future of psychotherapy? What do you think is happening here with the, this brain science and expansion? Um, in my very humble and limited view, I've spent a lot of times with there, a lot of time with, uh, burnt out therapists this year. Um, who have crossed over to mind body medicine, which is one of my homes. Um, I did their facilitator training this year, and most of the people who go through mind body medicine are doctors or therapists or social workers um, who have been educated in the traditional system and it's not working for a number of reasons, mostly for them, not necessarily their clients. It's mostly they're just talking through the lens of what they were, what the education was limited, did not include indigenous and tribal communal <laughs> rituals. I mean, mind body medicine training to me was all Ayurveda because it's exactly the same stuff I learned in Ayurveda, which is so fun. But one of the conversations, the underlying conversations of, I spent five days in January and five days in October over the 10 days was what's the future of therapy? Like, what are we gonna be doing with people because for the first time ever, all so many of our practices and techniques are evidence-based now. We've got loads of research, so we don't actually have to separate science and spirit. We get to bring them together. So what do you think about that? What's your perspective and where are you with all that? Uh, I am so excited about it. I, yeah. I know that there's a lot of fear in th these communities about what, what we'll have to do differently. Mm -hmm. uh, but I have always... Um, I came through a program that was very uh, eclectic and mm. incorporated all forms of spirituality. And I couldn't imagine learning about psychotherapy without learning about those pieces as well. Mm. Uh, I think wellness is a better umbrella term than mm -hmm. psychology. I think honestly, mm -hmm. at this, at this stage of where we are, um, and I think there's room for all of us. I think there's room for, psychiatry and uh, yogis and 
coaches and all of these, these different pieces. I, my, um, my only concern right now is about the, um, the shifting to online or phone work. Mm -hmm. And it's not because I'm against doing it. I actually, Mm -hmm. I can see why that kind of support is really useful, but I've done a, a, a lot of my training has been in trauma, but a lot of my training has also been in couples work and presence proximity is so key to helping people transform and feel Mm -hmm. safe and seen and known and you cannot get eye contact with facetime it is not the same thing hopefully we will have some research that maybe proves me wrong uh at some point about that but we know that you know having your partner with you Mm -hmm. holding your hand when you're talking about something really difficult or when you're when you're in the hospital it actually reduces your experience of physical pain to be connected with your partner. So therapists stand in for that. We create, you know, modeling relationships and not being in the room, not having that kind of healthy eye contact that triggers the endorphins for bonding and helps people experience being known and understood. I'm, I'm a little worried about that, but yeah. my hope is we're, human beings are incredibly adaptive. Maybe we'll come up with something that, that helps. Do you know, this just popped in my head when you said that, I have similar issues, I have similar, not issues, challenges, questions, theories, thoughts in in yoga and Ayurveda because it's so personal and you're reading energy and intuition and it's much harder to see, like I can see this part of you, but I don't know what's happening below. Are you writing? Are you distracted? Is there a dog? Like, which is all fine. It's just, you can't, you don't get the whole picture. Demir, have you seen any research on the mirror neurons being receptive on technology? I have not seen any research on that. I am hopeful that we get some and that it is uh, fascinating more. Exactly. Because that is such a tremendous finding uh, in the research that we create these, um, these connections with people when we are in close proximity and, and can alleviate pain and and make people feel calmer because of that kind of um, connection. I, I just don't know if it will work on yeah, a screen. I don't I either. And we have the same conversation in meditation because there's been so many wonderful um, studies around what the power of group meditation in real life and what sangha and retreat and what happens with transformation with nervous system, focus, attention, compassion, right? All of these wonderful qualities. And more and more, I see meditation groups online. And if you just sit together on Zoom and these pieces, I think we really swung. I think that there was a lot of care providers and holistic health providers who were very burnt out. And when online came, and very poor, and when online came, it, it allowed many people to reach more people and make more money without so much effort. Mm. And I think part of the burnout that I do see in caregivers and social workers and yogis who, who maybe have done a lot of that, it will swing back towards the middle. Cause so I, I am in this boat where I'm finding myself just craving more in real life. And I'm going back to offering some of those original, just quiet yoga classes, meditation for women, like just quiet things. It's not going to be all the people or all the money, but it's just back to sort of healing in a more sustainable way, which feels like the pendulum is kind of settling. Um, But also I'm aware of the communities that I'm in that are so ridiculously privileged when even talking about this stuff that it could just be my tiny little (laughs) lens, you know, because... Uh. I don't know. I just, I have those same questions. Like, and it's the same thing with journaling and writing through our emotions and writing to heal. You know, we've had years and years of research about that pen to paper. And now Mm -hmm. I have a lot of people who resist doing that and they want to do it on the computer. (laughs) And I'm like, I don't know. I've I've never seen the research that says that works as well. I, I haven't read it. I don't, I don't study with teachers who teach that. Um, I still think you need that hand to neural network, the, the connection that's happening, that's tapping into the emotions, but I don't know. And it's, uh, I mean, just, it overlaps with all of Brene Brown stuff on, on courage and vulnerability. Being in a group is so yeah. much more vulnerable. Uh, sitting with other people and being close in that way mm-hmm. can really uh, 
feel unsafe for, for people these days. And meanwhile, you know, whenever I'm working with clients, getting them into a, a therapy group is usually the most transformative work that we can do. Yeah. It's more effective. I mean, honestly, there are plenty of couples therapists and I might, I might actually start to include myself in that category who believe that if you are suffering from something and you're partnered, couples therapy is a way to a, a much faster way of, of resolving it. Mm -hmm. um, if one, it's, yeah. it's rarely just that one client has, you know, one partner has anxiety and the other one doesn't have anything else going on, but it's, mm -hmm. it's usually a system. And if we can work on this mm -hmm. in relationship, it's just so much more powerful. Um, and then you have the factor that it's hard to get into an office. It's hard to find a therapist who takes yeah. your insurance. It's hard to find time. It's hard to find all of those pieces. Mm -hmm. uh, it almost, I mean, I, I, I don't begrudge anybody who takes the other yeah. methods and, and gives yeah. it a try. Yeah. Uh, but if you're not having the results that you desire, right. you know, putting yourself into right. that vulnerable position of walking in and sitting with a stranger, I always tell clients, I'm not going to ask you to go any place I haven't been. I know what it's like to sit right. in a chair. Right. It is terrifying right. to sit across from a total stranger. And, and the, the real work comes in processing. What's it like for you to tell me that thing right now? Mm -hmm. What is it like for us to finally be discussing the thing that you've been keeping in, in your body for so long. I, I, I read a piece of research, which of course I, I love quoting that I can never remember the mm -hmm. source. So maybe yeah. I, <laughs> I transformed it for my own needs, but mm -hmm. that it takes an average of 90 seconds to process. An yeah. Emotion. Yeah. It, emotion code says that too, okay. that research. Glad yeah. to you hear have that. In yoga. Okay. Yeah. I've got confirmation. Yeah. And that you know, some people come into therapy after 10 years of I know. working so hard not to process that 90 seconds. It's amazing to see uh, the transformation that can happen by just yeah. naming it with another yeah. person. Um, yeah. And just knowing that the 90 seconds, I mean, I think this is what I mean about this powerful time that we're living in where we can take something like that's the average length of a powerful emotion and then use it in coaching and therapy and Ayurveda and yoga and social work in all the areas to say, guys, like we can do this. We can move through this 90 seconds together. I'm holding you. I'm supporting you. I think that's a, I think that shift in psychotherapy and therapy models that we know from coaching research about transformation in groups is so powerful because I think mm -hmm. that old model of one-to-one -one, and now we know, yeah, if you, well, that's fine. And that does work for lots and lots of people. But if you, there is sort of a speedy, a speedier process in group where you start to do that, that relation and that self-compassion mm -hmm. relation, because there's a Buddhist saying, I say pretty much every podcast episode, which is you are not so special. <laughs> <laughs> and I mean me, not you, like, I mean me, you, like the minute we get in group therapy, we're like, oh, I am not so special. Or in, in our case, our Lola community. I mean, that's what we are. We are a, a therapeutic health wellness community for women to talk about this in real life and be like, yeah, me too, me too, me too, me too. Okay, cool. I'm going to go you know, garden or work or pick up my kids from school because I'm not alone in this. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. that piece is more and more important, obviously, for mental health, you know, as Absolutely. we Absolutely. And I think anyone who says this is the only way to do this. Yeah. Really? Run. Turn, run, turn and run. Ways, though, right? <laughs> you should turn and run. But that person, like, what a corner to back yourself into. My God. Yeah. Was, we've learned so many different things just in yeah. a you know, 18 years that I've been doing this, it's like, yeah. uh, 17 years that I've been doing this. It's, it's our understanding of how couples function relationally. It's just completely transformed by the research that we now yeah. have. And, yeah. uh, it's, if you're not able to incorporate that, oof. Right. Uh, you're doing and I love with yourself. the, at least the people who I study or attract or read the Gottman's or Gay Hendricks or even Esther, like the cup on the couple side, they all are so deeply spiritual. You just yep. hear it through them. And as someone who I'm spirit over, like I came to health from spirit, not from science. I just love that the science backs it up. It's so whole to have to feel that, that masculine and feminine dance in these leaders. And that is just like, in terms of leadership and being alive and helping people right now, it's a powerful time, you know? I completely agree. It's, uh, I think we're really incredibly lucky to, to have all this. And I, I'm, I'm excited for my kids to, 
to I know. be born into a world where there, there is more of this understanding when they're definitely going to need it. Y E S. <laughs> Hopefully they will not ever have another Trump presidency and that will be, and they won't remember it. Okay. Um, that's a whole nother episode. Um, Stacy, are you taking new clients? Where can people find you? And for people who are not in DC, cause we do have a number of people who are not in DC. Um, will you possibly send me like one or two links of reputable learning either from a YouTube you mentioned or your teacher, just someone that's reputable that you've studied with that feels really important. Um, to Absolutely. Have that connection. Um, but for people who are in DC, where can they find you and. Right. Well, so I'm, my office is in Georgetown and I okay. am not taking new clients currently until okay. August because of travel. I, yeah, just, yeah. I don't think it's fair to get started with people this at this stage, but give me a call because okay. I can find somebody. I'm on many, many listservs. I can find okay. somebody who's taking people now. I can help you create a, a search for somebody who specifically has the training and the time of day and location and all those things that you might want. Uh, I know great people who are taking people right now. So please okay. Be, okay. be in touch. I always feel called to help people find the right match because yeah. it is so tricky. It is like yeah. dating. You have to have the right chemistry and I am not everybody's cup of tea. I can always find you somebody taller, shorter, fatter, thinner. I will. I, I know a lot of great people and that's my, mm -hmm. my um, job I see as not so much getting people in my door, but you know, helping cold calls are hard to make. So please yeah. reach out. I'm happy to help. My website is districtemdr.com. Okay. Um, I, it also Stacy Murphy, LPC.com. Those are both um, my websites, but I'm happy to send that to you separately. Okay. And, and I'll uh, put it in the show notes. So, and I would recommend the, um, international association of EMDR. So EMDRIA, E-M-D-R-I-A.org. It's uh, very useful as well. Okay. Awesome. Thank you for those resources. Stacy. thank you for being here. Thank you for your presence. Thank you for educating us and updating us on current techniques and, just again, giving people real tangible tools and items, learning about what it is and being able to, you know, if they need it or a loved one, being able to tap into that power and intuition of healing, which is really important. So thank you. Thank you. Oh, I'm grateful for the opportunity. It's um, a real pleasure to talk about something that is so crucial and uh, valuable in our world. Yeah. And takes a lot of courage. So uh, I, I really appreciate you being on the front lines of helping people learn about the different ways they can get to healing. There are a lot of ways to do this. There's not just one path. Yay. Thank goodness. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Exactly. All right, baby. Take care. Thank you. Thank so you. So great to see you. You too. It. Bye. Bye.